Good evening and welcome. My name is Al Snap. I'm president of the Ferguson Library. And if you could take this opportunity to turn your phone off or turn it to buzz, that would be really, really great. Um, I'm sorry for the delay. We were actually waiting for the donor. It's rare that we have a lecture series that is underwritten. But I want to welcome you to the first and annual Doe R. Sexton Lecture, underwritten by Mel Klugman. And um, when he comes in, it would be great for your whole applause. And hopefully we can find him soon. He's a generous donor, and he was a friend of Joe Sexton. And you will quickly see that Joe had a lot of interest. So the one thing you shouldn't expect from this lecture series is that we're going to stay on just one topic. Um, he was, um, our author tonight is indicative of the wide range of Joe's passions, and we're going to be exploring a lot of different areas. Joe Sexton was born in the small town of Litchfield, Minnesota, a place he considered a great place to grow up, where there was enough room so the whole family always had a pony, pigeons, baby chicks, rabbits, and dogs. Joe spent his childhood in Minneapolis and later attended a military high school in St. Paul where he became a first lieutenant in the cadet corps, was on the crack drill squad, quarterback of the football team, and co-captain of the track team. Always busy, his summer jobs included working as a Western Union boy, delivering messages in Minneapolis on a bike, and at a pea cannery in Montgomery. He enlisted in the Navy Air Corps and was called up a month after high school graduation, serving at training bases in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. He recalled this time as the most memorable of his life. Afterwards, he flew in the Navy Ready Reserve at Floyd Bennett Field in New York, New York. He flew the Navy dive bomber, torpedo bomber, and anti-submarine plane. He graduated in 1949 from the University of Minnesota with a degree in chemical engineering and started work for Exxon that summer. In 1951, he received his MBA from Harvard Business School. Joe remained with Exxon until his retirement 35 years later, including 15 years in Hong Kong as Exxon's chemical Far East product line manager. Throughout his career, his foreign assignments took him and his family, including sons Bennett, Stephen, and Stephen's here with us tonight, there to Sumatra, Java, <coughs> Australia, and Pakistan. <coughs> Joe's retirement years were busy and were highlighted by his service to the community. He was a member of St. Louis Parish, where he was a Eucharistic minister and belonged to the Teams of Mary. He was a member of Woodway Country Club and the Harvard Club of New York. He was social events chair of the Darien Senior Men's Association, a past secretary of the Canada Exxon and Minutes Club, a member of the Darien Cotillion and a member of the World <coughs> Affairs Forum. George's service also brought him here to the Ferguson as a volunteer with the Friends of the Ferguson Library, where he worked for 10 years with his wife Anne on the Library Books for Babies program, and you would often see both of them in attendance at our lectures. Joe always saw the best in everyone, and he never said an unkind word about anyone. He was a true listener. He was absolutely trustworthy. He had an unfailing enthusiasm to try new things and was always ready to go at a moment's notice. He loved to dance and had a contagious singing voice and an ear-splitting whistle. He, Joe was a gentleman and a gentle man. He loved and respected by all who had the opportunity to know him. So it was our pleasure to start this inaugural series in Joe's memory. Um, and I would like to ask Susan LaPerla, Director of Public Services, to come up. Thank you, Alice. Um, I'm so delighted to be here on this wonderful and happy occasion. And I would like to welcome Anne and other members of her family. Joe's son Steve is here, Anne's daughter Diane, her husband Michael, and children Claudia and Carson, and also Marge, Michael's mother, is here today. So we're very happy that they can all be here to celebrate Joe tonight. I'm here to introduce our illustrious speaker. I first learned about Dave when I read a review of Ike and McCarthy of the Wall Street Journal. It was in the weekend review section, which I read pretty faithfully every Monday on my lunch hour. And the review of Dave's book was really one of the most glowing I had read. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if this man could come to Stanford and speak to us? It also turned out that the book covered a lot of topics that were of interest to Joe. 
an illustrious World War II general who later became president, a conservative America, history, political intrigue, all wrapped up in a scholarly package, which I know Joe will appreciate as well. When we found out that Dave was a Midwesterner, it really sealed the deal for us. So upon a little investigating, I learned that Dave was on book tour, so that made it easy to find him through his publisher. So we began to connect with Dave to see if we could get him to come. In the ensuing weeks, our crack team of Ann, Barb Thomas, who can't be here tonight, and I spent many, 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 many days talking to Dave to use our charm and the art of gentle persuasion to have him come to Stanford. It was a difficult decision, but I'm so happy, and I speak from my heart, Dave, when I say we are truly grateful and really, really honored that you can be here tonight to deliver this wonderful lecture in Joe's memory. As far as a bio, Dave would like me to let you know that he holds a PhD in history from the College of William and Mary, and is the author of A Matter of Justice, Eisenhower and the Beginning of the Civil Rights Revolution, Eisenhower, 1956, The President's Year of Crisis, and the current book, Ike and McCarthy. Although it's not written in the program, I know he wouldn't mind if I let you know that he is, he is widely regarded as the authority on the Eisenhower presidency. So with that, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dave to stand. say it's an honor to be here, an honor to be invited here. Um, let's tell you, some of you, you saw me using asthma stuff. I have an asthmatic cough, and if I dissolve and cough somewhere in the middle of it, it'll, it'll go away. You don't, need to, you don't need to worry about me. I just, I mean, usually, I kind of can sublimate it, but we'll, we'll see. And uh, before I jump into my presentation, just to talk a little bit about Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower was roundly denigrated as a president for decades. The, uh, I, I don't, I'm a Kansan, I don't mean to pick on East Coast historians, but a lot of them, very liberal ones, just never forgave Ike for defeating Adlai Stevenson for the presidency. <laughs> and they not only put that in their books, but they taught it to their students. Meanwhile, Ike, who never forgot where he came from, established his presidential library in Adelaide, a town of about 10,000 in Kansas. And so, Abilene is not the most exciting place on the planet to visit. There's not even a movie in town. Uh, uh, but the documents there are extraordinary, and so in my old age, I had the great privilege of going and unearthing this treasure trove of documents that give a terribly different picture of Dwight Eisenhower. And maybe you've seen that in, in C-SPAN recently did a uh, a poll of 193 historians. And these 193 historians rated Eisenhower fifth among presidents only after Lincoln, Washington, and the Roosevelt's. That's extraordinary because for decades people thought he just wasn't much of a president. And partly that's Ike's fault. He had to, he did this this grandfatherly act in public. Uh, that really you know, covered over who he really was, and we'll get into some of that. So, uh, anyway, with that background, I just want you to understand that I've been privileged to help change the view of the president, as they say, in my old age, and that's, that's pretty special. So, for my call, I'm going to do this on occasion. Okay. March 27, 1953, Dwight Eisenhower won a big, big victory over Senator Joseph McCarthy. Ike's nominee for ambassador to the Soviet Union, Charles Boland, was opposed by McCarthy, but was confirmed by the Senate 74 to 13. Eisenhower grumbled to his aides that, quote, McCarthy has the bug to run for the president in 1956. Ike slapped his knee and thundered, the only reason I would consider running again would be to run against him. <laughs> Knowing Eisenhower, he probably punctuated that declaration with a theologically incorrect expletive. 
time, but he, he would he would do that. His his language was that of a soldier who never in public, never in public. <coughs> Flash forward to December 2nd, 1954. On that date, the United States Senate formally censured Joe McCarthy by a vote of 67 to 22. After censure, when McCarthy stood up to speak on the Senate floor, the chamber went empty. When he sat down with other senators in the Senate office, the Senate dining room, his colleagues would make lame excuses and leave. The bands of reporters who'd once hung on every word were gone. In late 1955, Army Council John G. Adams visited McCarthy at his home. They sat down and Joe pulled six ounces of, poured six ounces of gin. He looked awful, Adams wrote. Joe's hands shook. The gin trickled from the corners of his mouth when he took a sip. Adams described the man he left at the door as, quote, the cadaverous visage of McCarthyism, standing silently in the shadows, slowly dying. Indeed, Joe McCarthy did die on May 2nd, 1957. He was 48 years of age. Now, folks, that's a, that is a peek into a very complicated story. And if I confuse you in the next few minutes, just remember, the book is a whole lot better than the speech. <laughs> you know, when you do a half an hour talk, you just got to read out a lot of important stuff. And those who are here and already read it can testify to that. In terms of mystery stories, this is a how done it, not a who done it. In a who done it, we must follow the clues to find out who did the crime. In a how done it, we know who did it. And the question is how and why. William Ewald wrote a book a generation ago with a who done it title Who Killed Joe McCarthy? Ewald's final conclusion was somewhat ambiguous. Mine is not. Dwight Eisenhower did it. Ike and his trusted aides land launched a clandestine operation designed to wrap a gay lover scandal around the neck of a prestigious United States Senator in the President's own party in a congressional election year. And you've never heard that anywhere. But it's true. A word about that lover scandal. The 1950s was a horrendously homophobic period. Just the rumor, not the fact that someone was gay, could cost them their job or keep them from getting a job. At that time, it was widely believed that homosexuals were security risks because communists could blackmail them. You've probably heard some of the traditional explanations for Joe McCarthy's political demise. McCarthy, an alcoholic, did himself in. He was damaged by Edward R. Murrow's legendary See It Now television program. During the Army McCarthy hearings, television unmasked McCarthy as the lying demagogue he was. In this conventional version, the final nail of McCarthy's political coffin was the censure vote by the Senate. Now those are all legitimate factors, but until now we have not known that Dwight Eisenhower conducted a secret campaign to discredit McCarthy. That's the subtitle of the book, Eisenhower's Secret Campaign. And, and historians have assumed that Ike was downright cowardly in his response to the senator, refusing to use the bully, pul bully pulpit against him. Eisenhower refused to even mention McCarthy's name in public, believing that giving the senator presidential attention would only enhance his reputation. John Adams observed, quote, Eisenhower's indifference was deceptive. He could be in control while appearing to loathe. Who was Joe McCarthy? McCarthy represents what historian Richard Hofstadter called the paranoid style in American politics. Such paranoia, Hofstadter continued, bubbles up about once every generation. Every generation, we Americans just get scared. In the 50s, it was scared of communism. Now it's the scared fear of terrorism. In any event, McCarthyism became a staple in our political lectionary. On February 9, 1950, Joe McCarthy delivered a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia. The senator announced that he had, here in my hand, the names of 205 communists in the State Department. Of course, Joe didn't really have those names, but William E. Wall writes, wrote that from Wheeling onward, McCarthy presided over a permanent floating press conference. Lights, cameras, microphones followed him everywhere. In 1953, 
Due to Eisenhower's election, McCarthy acquired a new platform for his crusade. The Republicans captured a one-vote majority in the Senate. McCarthy became chair of the Government Operations Committee and, more important, its, its permanent investigative subcommittee. In that capacity, the senators subpoenaed witnesses, conducted one senator hearings, accused witnesses of guilt by association, and labeled as obviously communist anyone who dared to invoke constitutional protections against self-incrimination. Is everybody hearing me back here in the back? Okay, okay. McCarthy hired Roy Cohn, a young legal, legal prodigy, as his subcommittee's chief counsel. Cohn insisted that McCarthy add G. David Shine, a handsome son of a wealthy New York family, as an unpaid chief consultant. Cohn and Shine's intimate relationship would eventually trigger the 1954 Army McCarthy hearings. Bear with me for a second. Eisenhower sparred with McCarthy throughout 1953. The senator repeatedly opposed Eisenhower's key appointments. He held hearings in the alleged communist infiltration of the Voice of America and frightened librarians in American overseas libraries into removing books from their shelves. So the Eisenhower administration became accused of book burning. McCarthy sent Roy Cohn and David Schein on an investigative junket through, junket through Europe that scandalized American allies. Dwight Eisenhower hated censorship. On June 14, 1953, he spoke at commencement at Dartmouth College. Without mentioning McCarthy's name, the president urged, quote, don't join the book burners. Don't think you're going to, have, you're, you're going to conceal faults by concealing evidence that they ever existed. Don't be afraid to go into your library and read every book, as long as that document does not offend our own ideas of decency. How will we defeat communism unless we know what it is and what it teaches? And why does it have such an appeal for men? Why are so many people swearing allegiance to it? Of course, he said all that without using Joe McCarthy's name. Dwight Eisenhower loathed Joe McCarthy. Still, he adamantly refused to get down in the gutter with McCarthy. The President of the United States cannot afford to name names, he wrote a friend. Nothing would probably please McCarthy more than to get the publicity that would be generated by public repudiation by the President. During 1953, though, Eisenhower had other priorities than McCarthy. The nation was still at war in Korea, which he ended in July. The American people are still recovering from the traumas of depression in World War II. The Cold War with the Soviet Union had created a climate of fear. That was the lifeblood of, of McCarthyism. But, 1954 was different. <coughs> In January 1954, McCarthy's prestige was at its zenith with a Gallup poll approval rating of 50% favorable, 29% unfavorable. But by then, Eisenhower concluded that McCarthy was more than a nuisance. He was a threat to the president's foreign policy goals, to his legislative program, and indeed to his party's, his own electoral prospects. In July 1953, David Shine, Roy Cohn's boyfriend, was sent his army draft notice. And Cohn launched a frantic campaign seeking an assignment that would keep Shine with McCarthy's committee and, of course, with him. Cone constantly harassed the Army, insisting that Shine be available for what he euphemistically labeled committee business on nights and weekends at a nearby hotel. Thwarted at every turn, Cone angrily threatened to, quote, wreck the Army. In August 1953, at Cone's behest, McCarthy launched hearings on communists in the United States Army. This is August 53, with a five star general in the White House. Think about that. You know, I, I really think deciding to do that, it took a long time. But John McCarthy signed his own political death warrant. McCarthy's first hearing on the Army took place on August 31st, 1953. 
This one example is more of a the book he grilled Doris Walters Powell, an innocent, frightened African American clerical worker on maternity leave. And Joe McCarthy's first words to her were, quote, Let me say this, Mrs. Powell. We have information of Communist Party membership on your part. I still get a cold chill when I read that and the rest of that transcript. However, Dwight Eisenhower was happy behind the scenes. About the same time that David Schein got his draft notice, I called Fred Seaton in Nebraska. Anybody have any memory of who Fred Seaton is? Yeah, we Kansans know. <laughs> yeah, he eventually became Secretary of the Interior. The Seaton's a newspaper family came from Manhattan, just down the road from Eisenhower's Avenue. Fred's father had been a secretary to Senator Joseph Bristow, who had endorsed Ike's application at West Point. In 1937, Fred moved to Nebraska to become the publisher of the Hastings Daily Tribune. Upon the death of Nebraska's Republican Senator in December 1951, the governor appointed Seaton to that seat for just a year. In the Senate, Seaton developed a reasonably friendly relationship with Joe McCarthy. So, in July 1953, Ike asked Fred Seaton to take a redesigned assistant secretary position in the Defense Department. Fred would serve as the Pentagon's liaison with the press and Congress, and among other things, he was, he was to manage matters relating to Joe McCarthy. Ike told Charles Wilson, the Secretary of Defense, that he'd always looked upon Seaton, this is wonderfully military, he'd always looked upon Fred Seaton, quote, as a reserve division. <laughs> ready to go into action. McCarthy hearings into alleged communist subversion in the army continued for months. Eisenhower wrote in his memoirs that by January 1954, Joe McCarthy was, quote, riding high. Then came the turning point. On January 21st, Ike's top aides convened in the Attorney General's office. During that meeting, Army Counsel John Adams provided the, provided the details. McCarthy's and Cohn's repeated attempt to secure special privileges for David Schein. Chief of Staff Sherman Adams ordered John Adams to prepare a report, and the Army Council sent the White House a stack of documents in mid-February. Shortly thereafter, the White House returned those documents to Fred Seaton at, at the Pentagon with secret presidential orders to edit them into a report for publication. Meanwhile, McCarthy continued hearings on the Army. He harassed Irving Perez, a dentist drafted into the Army during the Korean War, who had invoked his constitutional rights rather than, rather than to say whether he'd ever been a member of the Communist Party. McCarthy branded, predictably, Perez a communist and subpoenaed Perez's commanding general, Ralph W. Zwicker, for testimony. Now, Ralph Zwicker, Zwicker was one of Ike's boys, a hero of the war in Europe. And on February 18th, Joe McCarthy confronted Zwicker in what John Adams called a savage performance. Again and again, McCarthy pressed Zwicker for details about how Perez got, Irving Perez got promoted and honorably discharged. And finally, McCarthy delivered the ultimate insult to this war hero. He charged that Ralph Zwicker was, quote, not fit to wear the uniform of the United States Army. Eisenhower on vacation in, in California was incensed when he heard about the attack on Zwicker, but as usual, he said nothing to the press. When Ike returned to Washington on February 24th, he did not know that Army Secretary Robert Stevens that very day had naively agreed to a secret luncheon meeting with McCarthy and other Republicans on his subcommittee. Stevens had intended to confront McCarthy about his vicious attack on Zwicker and demand that he respect military personnel testifying. Instead, the group talked Stevens into signing an agreement that the newspapers quickly labeled his surrender. When, the, when Stevens arrived back at the Pentagon that afternoon, Fred Seaton bluntly told the secretary, Bob, you've been had. The next morning, the New York Times ran a devastating front page photograph of McCarthy whispering in Bob Stevens' ear. The newspapers also settled on another false conclusion, that because Eisenhower had arrived back at the White House the same day as Stevens' infamous lunch with McCarthy, 
The president must have ordered, ordered Stevens to surrender to MacArthur. That was not true. In his diary, Press Secretary James Haggerty describes the president as, quote, very mad and getting fed up. I'm sure this was decorated with typical Eisenhower profanity, <laughs> but I wouldn't do it. That states it mildly. Dwight Eisenhower was having a full-blown presidential temper tantrum. This was the president thundered about, quote, his army. This guy McCarthy is going to get into trouble over this, he barked. I'm not going to take this one lying down. My friends tell me it won't be long in this army stuff before McCarthy starts using my name instead of Stevens. He's ambitious. He wants to be president. He's the last guy in the world who will ever get there if I have anything to say. And that's not invented dialogue. That's out of Jim Hagerty and Diary. Eisenhower ordered Stevens to the White House accompanied by Fred Seaton. The team led, led by Richard Nixon drafted a statement for Stevens to issue repudiating the chicken launcher agreement. I himself edited it for 30 minutes and Haggerty noted, quote, made it stronger. Stevens read the statement to the press filled with the general's terse military language. I shall never accede to the abuse of army personnel under any circumstances, including committee hearings, Stevens declared. I shall never accede to them being browbeaten or humiliated. When Stevens finished, James Haggerty rose and said, on behalf of the president, he has seen the statement, he approves and endorses it 100%. From that moment forward, the White House war with Joe McCarthy accelerated. Fred Seaton and other key Pentagon people intensified their work rewriting John Adams' report on McCarthy, Cohn, and Stein. In early March 1954, the Eisenhower forces exploited two important events, really on March 9th. On March 9th, Republican Senator Ralph Landers attacked Joe McCarthy in a speech on the floor of the United States Senate. Did the White House recruit, recruit Flanders? Probably, I can't quite prove it. Flanders had lunch the previous week at the White House with his good friend, White House Chief of Staff, Sherman Adams. And on the Senate floor, Flanders asked about Joe McCarthy. To what party does he belong? One must conclude, the Vermont Senator boomed, that his is the one-man party, and its name is McCarthyism. Flanders concluded his speech with sarcasm about McCarthy's persecution of Irving Perez. McCarthy, Flanders, quote, dons his war paint. He goes into his war dance. He admits his war hoops. He goes forth to battle and proudly returns with the scalp of a pink army dentist. Flanders had already sent a copy of his remarks to Eisenhower and publicly commended them. That evening, March 9th, Edward R. Murrow eloquently condemned McCarthy on his See It Now television program, and he included quotations from the Flanders speech. Murrow derided the senator as a one-man committee who had demoralized the State Department and leveled charges of conspiracy against the Army, including declaring that Ralph Swicker was unfit to serve. Murrow argued, quote, that the line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one. And the junior web senator from Wisconsin has stepped it over repeatedly. Murrow closed with devastating eloquence. We will not walk in fear one of another. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason. It is no time, Murrow concluded, for people who oppose Senator McCarthy's methods to keep silent. We cannot, he declared, defend freedom abroad by deserting it at home. <clears throat> if you have a chance to pick up that presentation on, online, it's, you know, I didn't share nearly enough of it. It's quite a lot. Two days later, on March 11th, Fred Seaton released the 34-page Shine Report on behalf of the Army. Eisenhower, even in his memoirs, never acknowledged his role, writing that the Army, not the White House, moved over to the attack. I did not mention Fred Seaton, who was operating under his direct orders. Jim Haggerty called that report a pip. 
showing constant pressure by Cohen to get his shine, shine a soft army job with Joe in and out of threats. The Hagerty Hanger, believed that the report would bust things wide open. It did. The result was a firestorm of controversy leading to the televised Army McCarthy hearings. For two months, for two months, the American public watched as the cameras unmasked McCarthy as the obnoxious boy he was. Anybody remember how many uh, television networks we had in those days? Yeah. Not like what we have now. So people watched this hour after hour. In May, the hearings erupted in demands by both parties for testimony about that January 21st meeting. You remember that? At which the Eisenhower forces had first examined the McCarthy Coons-Shine relationship. I refused to allow his personal advisors to be subpoenaed, thereby unmask his own involvement. So on May 17th, Eisenhower invoked executive privilege, citing historic precedent for the protection of presidential advisors. In response, McCarthy challenged government employees to disobey their superiors. To disobey their superiors. Report directly to him because, quote, their oath to protect and defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, is a commitment that towers far above any presidential secrecy directly. Eisenhower shot down McCarthy's tirade with a judicious statement issued under the Attorney General's name. Then I called his press secretary to the Oval Office and bandit his rage at, quote, the complete arrogance of McCarthy. Pacing behind his desk, Eisenhower thundered that McCarthy's challenge to federal employees to disobey their superiors, quote, amounts to nothing but a wholesale subversion of public service. McCarthy, he marked, is making exactly the same kind of plea to him that Hitler made to the German people. Both tried to set up personal loyalty within the government while both were using the pretense of fighting communism. McCarthy is trying deliberately to subvert the people we have in government, people who are sworn to obey the law, the Constitution, and their superior offices. I think this is the most disloyal act we've ever had by anyone in the government of the United States. You wouldn't forgive me, I'm sure some of you would, if I left out Joe Welch's famous confrontation with McCarthy, which took place on June 9, 1954. McCarthy charged that Welch had in his law firm a young man named Fred Fisher, who'd been associated with an allegedly pro-communist organization. A hush fell over the room. When McCarthy hurled that accusation, Welch sat with his head in his hands, staring at the table. Then he addressed the hearing chairman, Carl Munn. Mr. Chairman, under these circumstances, I must have something approaching a personal privilege. McCarthy was pacing about, ordering aides to retrieve his file on Fred Fisher. Welch repeatedly tried to get McCarthy's attention without success. Finally, he declared, until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. Fred Fisher is starting what looks to be a brief career with us. Little did I dream, Welch continued, you would be so reckless and cruel as to do an injury to that lad. I fear he shall always bear a scar needlessly inflicted by you. If it were in my power to forgive you for your reckless cruelty, I would do so. I like to think I'm a gentleman, but your forgiveness will have to come from someone other than me. McCarthy resumed his attack on Fisher and Welch interrupted in a commanding voice. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? Uh, note that the Republicans made numerous attempts to shut down the hearings. But Eisenhower, behind the scenes, vetoed end of them, ending them until mid-June 1954. Oh, when people go to the White House, I could say, oh, when will it be over? When will it end? But he used Army Secretary Robert Stevens to shoot down those efforts. Finally, Stevens brought a plea from McCarthy himself to Eisenhower to end 
the hearings for the sake of the country. Eisenhower listened, slapped his dick, and declared, no, we've got the bastard right where we want him. <laughs> By the time the hearings ended, McCarthy was upside down in the in polls. In July 1954, Roy Cohn resigned to return to his New York law practice and eventually become, become the lead attorney and mentor for 13 years to Donald Trump. That's another story. <laughs> uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on that. Folks. On December 2nd, 1954, he, he was the, um, he worked with Trump for some 13 years. In that, uh, on December 2nd, 1954, McCarthy's senatorial colleagues censured him by a vote of 67 to 22. Two days later, Eisenhower invited Senator Arthur Watkins of Utah, the chair of the censure committee, to the White House. Afterward, the president issued a statement commending Watkins for, quote, a very splendid job of managing the censure process. That was more than Joe McCarthy could take. On December 7th, he walked into the first hearing of his subcommittee in months and apologized publicly to the American people forever supporting Dwight Eisenhower, the president. <laughs> but the struggle was over. In, in a June 1955 meeting with the legislative leaders, Eisenhower repeated a joke that was making the rounds in Washington. It's no longer McCarthyism, the president said. It's McCarthy wasn't. <laughs> Eisenhower emerged publicly from his silence on McCarthy in an article written for the Reader's Digest just prior to his death. Ike edited out his harshest criticisms of McCarthy. I've seen you know, the originals for that. Still, he could not resist writing, quote, a lot of people today, even today, don't know is that behind the scenes, I was doing all I could to assist those who were wrongly accused. And in many cases, my efforts were effective. He recalled, Eisenhower recalled that once the struggle with McCarthy was over, a former critic of his approach to McCarthy said to him, by gosh, Mr. President, you were right about McCarthy. And the smiling Eisenhower responded, sometimes I am. <laughs> Dwight D. Eisenhower died on March 28, 1969. His article, We Must Avoid the Perils of Extremism, was published the following month. For all his editing, Dwight Eisenhower fed finally, publicly denounced Joe McCarthy. Thank you. I welcome your questions. I'm going to sit down for a moment. Just forget. Stand up and, and say any question you have or any comment you have as clearly as possible so everybody can hear. Yes, sir. I have a question. Do you see any parallels between what happened <laughs> with Ike and today with the political environment that we're all facing? The question is, do we see parallels with today? I do, but I, as I said to you before, I do not pretend to be an expert on that. Clearly, Roy Cohn became a major advisor and uh, 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 an attorney for Donald Trump. They first got together in 1973, and uh, that's when the United States government was suing Trump and his father for discrimination in their housing. And Roy Cohn told him, tell him to go to hell and take him to court. That was Cohn. And so Cohn, it appears, taught Trump a number of the techniques from McCarthy. But I don't know, I don't want to offend you with that. I am not a pundit. I'm not a current commentator. I'm just a scholar, okay? <laughs> yes. Um, during most of, now, McCarthy started uh, this in 1950, and for the next two years, Harry Truman was president. Did he do anything to stop him? And if not, oh, Truman, Truman denounced him all the time, and I thought Truman was wrong about that, that all he did was get any more attention. And by the time Truman left office, McCarthy was a bigger, bigger fish than him. And I, that's why I just wouldn't even use his name. 
Yes, sir. So, based on my own understanding, is that Truman and Ike actually shared a, uh, a friendship and a mutual hatred over um, Joe McCarthy, but eventually, I think through some political subversion, that it tore the friendship apart. What are your thoughts from Ike's perspective about that whole portion of their relationship? Well, Ike never quite forgave Truman for continuing to attack him. Unlike recent presidents who haven't gotten taken on new presidents, Truman did. And he was quite quite tough on Eisenhower, continued to be even after he took office. So I think they lost their relationship out of that. Uh, they were not close friends anyway. Not really. Uh, uh, Truman had attempted to persuade Eisenhower to run on the Democratic ticket and did not succeed. So I don't think they were really close, and as I say, I thought that, that Truman made a mistake to uh, rhetorically go after McCarthy, that it is making more famous. I'm sorry, i got to get off my feet for a moment. Do you want the microphone to watch you? Thank you. You hear me, can you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Forgive me for needing to sit down. I've just not been well for the last month. And so uh, I got through the presentation. And it, caused a lot, it caused a lot of anxiety with the library people and, uh, and Sexton and all that about whether I was going to be able to come. But I'm here. <laughs> Other question? Yes, sir. I understand that a lot of the information that McCarthy used came from Herbert Hoover. That's alleged. I didn't find a lot of evidence about that. But I think Hoover played both sides of the street. He was interested only in himself. But yeah, and, uh, and it is alleged it doesn't quite fit the study I was doing during 53, 54. You know, I did a very narrow study. Okay. And there's not much evidence that Hoover was particularly in league with McCarthy in case he, he, during the Army McCarthy hearing, he caused him some real trouble. Wow. But uh, I, I wouldn't dispute that. I think Hoover, as I say, played both sides of the street. <laughs> Most of my information came from the book Hoover, Hoover and His Secrets. Yeah. A lot of information in that that he was playing. You know, Jagger had a follow on just about everybody. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, ma'am. Among McCarthy's followers or supporters, who were the most ardent in the American public? Among the American public? Who were the most ardent? Those of these followers? Oh, gee, I'm not sure I have a quick and, and dirty answer to that. There, there were a lot, you know, they, just the American people, uh, you know, he, <coughs> I, I would have you, <coughs> he had journalists who were with him, he had, um, yeah, I'm forgetting the name of the main order. I'm not answering, I'm not answering your question very well. But, you know, he had that 50% approval rating in 1954. And uh, I think, without the Armand McCarthy hearings, that he would have continued to be very popular and, uh, but that's not answering your question about who supported there. There were journalists, there were conservative journalists who, who did. Well, I guess I wanted to know what, were there portions of the United States that were more in support of him than others? Well, Wisconsin, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, any of the really conservative states, including my state of Kansas. Uh, 
I don't know, I'm not prepared to answer that. Forgive me for dodging a question that I, I try not to answer something unless I <coughs> really, <coughs> really get pretty precise about it. People watched, you know, <coughs> people watched the army guard the areas day after day, week after week, <coughs> for two months. Gee, I'm sorry. And uh, the television, this was, this was, the television was nearly dawning. This was a huge influence. And certainly it unmasked McCarthy. He drank too much, you, people could see it on the tube. His blowing tactics were clear on the tube in the system. Very, very bad for him. I think without those hearings, I'm not sure they would have got me. Hmm? Yeah, I have two minds on this. I mean, Eisenhower was definitely very shrewd. And he developed the country with the highway system and uh, ended the Korean War and uh, announced the military industrial complex at the end. But this appears to be some of the blight of his record. It was a reign of terror at the time. People were scared to say anything. I remember, I, I seem to recall, Robert Kennedy was also part of uh, McCarthy's That's councils. Correct. That's there. correct, yes. And Welsh did ambush him at the hearing. It was also McCarthy, McCarthy and the Kennedys were actually very close. Close, right. So, so to me, <clears throat> Yes, he, he helped bring it down, but still, I think some of the blight on his, because it, it continued. I mean, the blacklist continued into the 60s, and um, the House of American activities continued. And That's so true. it was really part of the administration. It's true. One of the leading authors, Thomas Reeves, says that there was more to McCarthyism than McCarthy. And he's right. It preceded his fame. It, 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 it later as the House of American, Un American Activities Committee. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, the only thing I can say, well, I think what you're kind of alluding to is that we expect the President of the United States to use the bully pulpit to be a public educator and to educate people about issues. I confess to you, Dwight Eisenhower did not do that. And if you want to rate him in terms of being a public educator, I'm not sure he gets that high marks. On the other hand, he believed that uh, if he took on McCarthy, he, he would make himself the issue, not McCarthy. But it is clandestine, it's deceptive. I mean, this guy had deception in his bones. You know, you may recall that he, uh, he and his staff had fooled the German general staff about when and where the greatest military armada in human history would land in Europe. I mean, he, he was deceptive with capital D. And, uh, and but I, I think your point's well taken. <coughs> in terms of expecting a president to educate the public, he did not do that. Okay, let's back row first into this one. Thank you. I'm wondering if you perceive any um, connection or learning that Nixon might have had that was applied later during the whole Watergate scandal, that he, as he was vice president under Eisenhower, watched that kind of deception go on and behind the scenes stuff and manipulation? Well, Nixon, Nixon advised Eisenhower quite a bit on McCarthy. And uh, but Nixon was alive with Ike, not with McCarthy. And uh, Erwin Gelman, who's a wonderful scholar, that name may not ring a bell to you, and he's the leading Nixon scholar in the country. And Irv, Irv uh, wrote a, published a book in 2015 on the Nixon-Eisenhower relationship when, when Nixon was vice president. So Nixon, I think, was faithful and loyal to Eisenhower. And the trouble with Watergate is, uh, 
you don't have to agree with me, but Nixon was not that bad a president. But the way he left office has tarred him forever. And he did begin to take on some kind of McCarthy-esque sort of approaches to things, I think, at the end. It, it was very sad. Uh, let's see, I had, uh, yeah, you were the next. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering, in his private, Eisenhower's private papers, if he ever mentioned the similarities between Hitler and what he saw in Europe and what McCarthy was doing. Well, the item I read to you, and there's more detail in the book, absolutely. You know, he compared McCarthy to Hitler. And, uh, and you know, I don't know whether you caught that, maybe I didn't do well at reciting that, but, but he, he did. He, he's, when he says that this is the most disloyal act in the history of the American government, uh, that, that McCarthy asked government employees to report to him, not the president. And uh, yeah, so very much so. And, and that's better explained. I, I, I repeat, the book is a lot better than the speech. <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff I left out in the, in the presentation. Okay. Yes, sir. What was it that actually killed him? Why did he die? Well, the, um, the obituary said acute hepatitis. Uh, we all suspect, we can't prove it, the sclerosis of the liver. This guy was an awful drunk. He couldn't get through the morning without tossing down some, some whiskey, uh, you know, just continually throughout the day. He was just, you know, and in fairness to him, in those days we didn't have rehab programs like we have now. But uh, no, that anybody would have to be blind, deaf, and dumb not to realize that McCarthy's alcoholism helped send him to an early grave. Well, I think the latter, but there are some people, Stan Evans uh, wrote a book defending McCarthy. There are some books out there that, um, Stan Evans, I'm not getting his full name right. Anyway, he wrote a book, uh, you know, Blacklisted by History, in which he defends McCarthy. You know, one thing we have to say is there were spies in the United States government. There were. And the Eisenhower people knew there were, and that's why they enunciated this business, this, this thing of saying that government employment was a privilege, not a right. I didn't talk about that, but it's in the book. It was a privilege, not a right. And so, you know, and so including homosexual people could be shunted out by the Eisenhower people because they felt that they could be blackmailed by the communists. And so, um, uh, you know, there, there were spies. That's been well documented. Yes? But after the vicious attack on Fred Fisher, how did he fare in life? Fred Fisher? Yeah. After I... He went on to have a, what I, what I know, a fairly distinguished uh, <coughs> career with, with Joe Welch. Welch, of course, did, made a couple of movies, became quite famous. But as far as I know, uh, Fisher did well, but I don't know any details of his later life. But, uh, yes, where, where? Oh, okay, sir. Uh, sitting here right now, how do you feel about the, the, the fact that uh, Eisenhower did not meet or even attempt to defend the attacks on uh, Marshall? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it, that actually is the prologue to the book. Is it? That whole episode. I left that out in my presentation. What was the question? He's talking about Eisenhower. On October 3rd, 1952, Eisenhower gave a speech in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with Joe McCarthy on stage. And in that speech, McCarthy had attacked George Marshall, the great American. I, you know, you know about the Marshall Plan. I mean, if there's ever a great man in American history, to me, it's George Marshall. And he was a mentor to Eisenhower. He had a lot to do with Eisenhower being appointed to head the uh, Allied forces. And, and uh, McCarthy had, in effect, accused uh, 
Marshal of Treason. And he lost China to the Red Sea, he lost Eastern Europe to them. And, uh, 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 what am I, I don't know. Why didn't uh, Ike defend him? Yeah, well, he did plan in that speech, thank you, I'm losing track of He was going to put 74 words of distinct praise in that speech. With McCarthy sitting on the on the on the stage, so he was going to stick a rhetorical thumb in McCarthy's eye. But on the you know, Ike was not an experienced politician. And on the train going to Milwaukee, the Wisconsin politicians surrounded him and pressed him and said, "We we may lose Wisconsin's electoral votes if you do this." And he finally angrily said, okay, take it out. Now the problem is that meanwhile, Fred Seaton, you remember I mentioned him, <coughs> was Ike's publicist. And Fred had already dropped a hint to New York Times reporter that there was words of praise for Marshall were gonna be in there. Well, the next day, they weren't there. And furthermore, Joe McCarthy I do apologize, folks, you've been very patient. Joe McCarthy took credit for talking Ike into taking those words out of the speech. That was not true, it was a lie. But uh, back to this gentleman's statement. I didn't refute it. So, so it was not Ike's best moment. Okay, he was a naive politician. He learned a lot during that first year. <coughs> well, who are we? Who's here? Who's here? Try not to go away too quickly if you have personal questions. We have books for sale back there uh, by the friends of the Ferguson Library. There's